In 2022, I came to Union Level, Virginia to make photographs and video of the incredible abandoned row of storefronts found along the road. Union Level got its first postmaster, James Bridgeforth, in 1836. It was a tobacco growing region that declined after the Civil War. It was revived in the early 1900s when the Southern Railroad came through town. By the 1920s, there were several general stores, a barber, a pharmacy, a boarding house, and a dance hall. But the Great Depression decimated the businesses in town, and sources say Union Level never really fully recovered. Trains stopped coming in the 1980s, and the train depot and the tracks have since been removed. And while it's called a ghost town, there are still people living in and around Union Level. And in the summer of 2023, a year after my first visit, I received an invitation to come back to Union Level to learn more about the history of the town from someone who was born and raised there. What I captured was a fascinating first-person oral history of the town from a gentleman who was born in 1948 and remembers the community as it was. James O. Thompson, who goes by Jimmy, now owns three of these beautiful relics and he's one of the last keepers of the town's history and of its memory. What you're about to see and hear are Mr. Thompson's own evocative descriptions of life in Union Level and some of the photographs and artifacts that he holds dear. Some of his memories are so vivid that they really take you back in time to a simpler way of life. Like his recollection of living in the house that still stands across the street. Sleeping with his windows open at night, remember this was before the widespread use of air conditioning, and being awakened on Saturday mornings to the sounds of screen doors on the storefronts as customers came and went. Okay y'all, with no further delay, here's Jimmy Thompson in Union Level, recorded on Saturday, July 29th, 2023. My name is James O. Thompson. Uh, they call me Jimmy. I was raised right here in this little town. Uh, I was born in 1948 and well 50 and on I have the members of all the stores and the people and all that I grew up with. And uh, this is a newspaper clipping from the Mecklenburg Times, April 8, 1938. It gives a lot of information about it. And uh, it tells right here, C.P. Jones Drug is modern and reliable store. That's a, a little article about that. Union Level is in the heart of the farming belt. Shows a picture of uh, Zion Methodist Church. And it was founded in 1805. Now this was uh, 35 or 40 years before Union Level was kind of recognized because this used to be just a stage stop. From Stony Cross over to a uh, <clears throat> place on number one called Lombardy Grove. And uh, it also goes on to uh, tell you about F.T. Bailey. He was a uh, barber around here. Mr. L.W. Lett ran the store right here behind us uh, on that side. And then J.A. Thompson was the big white store beside uh, Mr. Jones is there. <clears throat> there was also a store on the other side of that, the first brick store was Summons and Drumright. And I think uh, Mr. Summons sold out to Mr. Drumright because he had a lot of other interests at the time. The next store up was R.A. Williams, and he took that over after the bank closed. And then uh, it tells about the Baptist Church organizers in 1911, and the reason I remember that so well, that was the year my father was born. Hmm. So, uh, anyways, it's got a picture of the town itself, and. Uh, Zion Church again, it shows the picture and, and the history of some of that. And as I grew up around here, I came aware that this at one time had been an oak grove. If you look in all these old houses and the yards, there were a lot of oak trees. And some of them are still there today. Of course, it's all cleared out and what have you. But uh, I've got a picture that I, I want to show you about the brick 
store up on the far end. Uh, that was Mr. A.H. Ferguson, but the original store burned about 1960. And uh, a fellow named uh, Blakely Gill uh, was owned it and run it at the time. And uh, he he eventually sold it, got rid of it, and um, it's belong it, owned by somebody in South Hill now, Ms. Newman. But uh, the old garage up on the end, that got into the Thompson family in the 1930s, but a guy named Blaylock ran that. And that's where the motorcycle was found. And uh, I don't remember it being a motorcycle shop. Uh, somebody in the neighborhood here would sell boats. They had to order them and have them shipped in. But there wasn't a boat dealership back here any means, you know. But uh, this is just some of the highlights of what went on when it talks about the, uh, the early post office. And uh, just things that I grew up with that, that most people, you know, weren't, weren't aware of. Let's, if you wouldn't mind, let's get you just to come right in front of me here and hold that up. And I'm just going to see if I can get some get a picture of that. That looks good, and I'm going to get it on my phone, too. What year is this newspaper? 1938, April. Now, this was during the Depression. So I'm assuming Jay Thompson was your father, or was your? It was my great uncle. Great uncle, okay. Um, he and his wife Margaret only had one child, named Lewis. And Lewis never mar married or had any children. And uh, he was kind of a small person in stature. And uh, Mama told me from the time that I was you know, a couple of years old and all, Lewis would come to the house and spend a lot of time with me. And growing up in the 50s and 60s, I used to ride with him all over the neighborhood to the farms that he owned to just spend time with him. And on weekends, we'd ride horses. And uh, I don't know, it was a lot of, a lot of people in the family and, and the closest kin he had were cousins. And uh, it just worked out that that uh, we ended up looking after him in his last years, which he died in 2000. And my wife fixed his meals and brought them over here to him and, and, and kind of looked after him. I noticed when I picked up your video on YouTube that you talked about Mr. Jones. Now, you had a great deal of information about him. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of Mr. Jones and his wife and some of their friends. I don't really know who two of the ladies are, but the one that's on his uh, side is his wife that you spoke of. So that's C.P. Jones. Right. And which one of his is his wife? The one on this side right okay. here. Okay. The other two ladies, I've asked, and I really can't get a de uh, definition of, or define who they are. This photo was taken here in Union Level, do you know? Right in front of the post, uh, right in front of the drugstore. That's his drugstore right there. That's a great photo. All right. Another thing that you'll notice in it is the building beside it, right here. That building burned in the 1940s. I've got some history on that in the, in the uh, truck there. But um, we always called it the old post office lot. I've got a deed to it now that 
was this. Um, this is another photo that was taken at a uh, farm down the road here. This was Mr. Jones's wife, and this uh, was Mr. Drewy Meyer. He was a uh, surveyor around here for many years. And this was Mr. Meyer's wife, Miss Callie, we called her. And then there are the other ladies that were in Mr. Jones's photo, and, I, and her all their husband, and I don't know any of them. I think it was a group from Florida that came up here and visited. This is a picture of my sister and her husband, probably about 1948, 49. And it was taken up in the yard beside the let store. <coughs> but over here where the dumpster's at, this is where the old depot was at. And it's very few pictures you can find of this depot. The picture I'm gonna show you now It's a picture of the old hotel. It was called the Ross House. And uh, it burned in the 1970s. It was owned by uh, Blakely Gill, and it was across from the old Ferguson store, which he owned when it burned. And where would this have been? <coughs> this would have been right across from the uh, dance hall in the little brick store on the left side of the road here. And there's nothing left of that, I guess. No, it's it's long gone. I think they're going to put a, a modular house in that now. Mm. But uh, I've got some history on that um, in the truck. This is the only photograph that I have come across in all the years I've been around here of Mr. Ferguson's store. It was just a tin building. And... Uh, he sold Sinclair products. And that was also on the, uh, the big picture there about him being the proprietor. <clears throat> I think my wife did this. We're not really good in photography, but she, she blew this thing up. Oh yeah. And if you'll notice, this lady was Christine Thompson. She was about my sister's age, and this had to be taken in the late 40s because the road in front of the store was gravel. They didn't pave these roads until the early 50s. Now over behind the, uh, where we call the depot down here, that was a side track. And they would bring the gravel cars in here, set them off to the side track, <clears throat> and then they'd bring in a clam bucket crane and load the, uh, dump trucks and a big tar bucket, they uh, thawed the roads, which made travel a lot more pleasant. Right. I mean, this was a complete dust bowl at one time. But uh, these are some of the photographs that I furnished a, a gentleman back in the mid 90s. He did a, a book called Around South Hill. And I had the most photographs of Union Level, so he came to me and I explained what I could to him. And some of these I hadn't found yet. Hmm. I didn't find them until a few years ago. They were packed up and stuff. The old hotel picture was 1956. There have been a, a couple of books written. One was John Knipe, a guy from up around Chase City. <clears throat> and the other one was by a lady right over here near Gordon's Lake. She's a real history buff, and due to her, uh, Miss Frances Clark is her name, and due to her work and help of her friends and all, they put a great book together about Mecklenburg County. I'll show you this. Is that available anywhere? I think we can still get that, and these right here... John Knight, which I'll show you in just a second, uh, you can get at CVS Drugstore in South Hill. Okay. He wrote several books. One was about Chase City, Virginia, 
and years ago after the Civil War, that was called Christiansville. And then he did one of Clogsville and sur surrounding areas. Um, these are old checks that I picked up from his store accounts and stuff. And this one was 1920, which really, realistically, isn't that old. This one was on the William Goode Bank Building in Borden, Virginia, uh, 1894. Mr. E.L. Petty. Now, he was real prominent in this town. There were several of the brothers. And uh, this is where uh, my great uncle bought his house from E.L. Petty. This is another check was 1887. And this was kind of a, <clears throat> a counter check. Anybody could take it and write on it, fill it out, and you catch most any bank, they cash it. This was by E.S. Petty, Mr. E.L. Petty's brother. <clears throat> These clippings right here are something that's uh, a great part of my life. This young lady and I grew up in Union Level. Well, not she didn't grow up here. She come over and stay in the summertime with her aunt. Her name was Rosalind Jean Nichols. And we rode horses. And we were allowed to go most anywhere around here <clears throat> that we wanted to go as long as we were home by lunch. Uh, Rosalind Jean's aunt, Miss Rose Simmons, would give Rosalind a quarter in the morning. And uh, we would stop up here at, at the stores, different ones at different times. And I'd go in the store, I'd get two Pepsi Colas, two candy bars, and she still had a nickel left. <laughs> and we spent the morning just rambling. Now, anywhere that you can walk or ride around Union Level in 20 mile radius, I've rode a horse or I've walked a bird dog. I mean, that was my passion back in the 60s and 70s. But this young lady played a very important part in my life for a lot of years. She still lives over uh, near what we call Big Fork. But, uh, you still talk to her? I still uh, talk to her. I get, get, um, cards from and what have you. <clears throat> the um, the book by Mr. Knipe is called Around South Hill. And uh, like I said, he wrote several of them. Uh, it gives you the railroad communities around here, which Union Level was one of them. It gives you the old photographs of uh, South Hill Atlantic Danville Railroad, which they took over from Southern Railroad. And uh, I was going to find them right here. I think I'm close. What do you know about where the name Union Level came from? <clears throat> Not a lot. Uh, you'd hear different tales. Union Level didn't originally start right here. Uh, from the history I got out of paper clippings and all years ago, a lady named Miss Pettis Gill had a store around here. And as the railroad came in, the people with, you know, the knowledge of how the country was developing, um, they began to move the businesses closer to the railroad. And um, these are some of the pictures right here that I just went through with you. This is another picture of the depot. That's my half brother and his wife. They come down and visit in the summertime. Am I putting a shadow on that way you yeah, can't see it? I can see it now, thank you. Uh, up at the top is a picture of two, two men that had a very big influence on my life as far as horses. Uh, this was Lewis Thompson, Ashby Thompson's son I told you about. Mm -hmm. This was a 
friend that lived over next to 58, which is just two or three miles, named Robert H. Watson. And on Sundays, they'd get together and ride horses. And uh, I'd tag along with them. Everywhere they go, I'd try to go. <clears throat> this is a picture of John Eddie Smith, Ashby Thompson, and Mr. C.P. Jones standing in front of the drugstore. In those days, they had an awning and a lot of other things. All the stores had an awning, and they'd have shades in the window because you can see this morning, the light come in from the east, and it showed right in the windows. And they dropped the awnings, and, and uh, try to keep the produce, you know, from getting too much heat and all them uh, other things in the store windows. Um, the picture right here at the top is Ashby Thompson and his wife Margaret standing in front of the merchantile store. Uh, the picture right here at the right is another picture of the old hotel, which was up here on the left. Mm -hmm. This is my sister standing in our yard beside this the old let store. And uh, this is another picture of my mother and my half brother standing in the front yard with the background of uh, Union Level behind it. And I saw that one somewhere online, I believe. <clears throat> out there. It very well could be. Uh, right here, this was a uh, and that was old Model A, Model A, I'm sure, mm -hmm. that uh, Mr. Charlie Gill would come over on uh, Saturdays or Sunday and visit his mother, which lived up in the apartment above this old store. And that would have been the one that's down... The, that later became the last post office okay. in Union Level. That's on the other side of the bank there. Just on the other side of the bank. This is a picture of J. Thompson's house, which he bought from E.L. Petty. Now, my understanding was that Mr. Ferguson um, built that house. This is a picture of Mr. Thompson's son. He was probably 10 years old. That would have been about 1933 and his pony, and his dog, and his little wagon. Now he, he takes stuff from the store here and ride around through the community and deliver it and pick stuff up and go play with his friends. This right here is a picture of the Baskerville Depot, which still stands. And it was the same thing as Union Level. My brother told me that, you know, he was here in the 1930s <clears throat> and uh, through traveling around the community and all, he said Baskerville and Union Level were the same design. Hmm. When did this town start to die off and what year did, did it pretty much die off? Well, the history of it is, is, is pretty much factual. It, it started about the 1840s. The railroad didn't come in until 1889. And there were good times. Tobacco was the main thing around here. Uh, people only raised hay and corn because they had to feed the livestock and everything was done with horses and mules. Uh, so really the early 1900s is probably when it became its heyday. You know, you talked about Mr. Jones having a store that burnt down and then they rebuilt it. And uh, you got to stop and look Back then, everything was heated with wood and coal. Fires were common, you know. And uh, it really just uh, surprised me how quickly they would rebuild something. <clears throat> Mr. Jones and his brother, I think it was one named John and Mr. West Jones, I, I'm sure they were kin, I don't know as to how close, but um, they were people of vision back in that earlier time. 
they could see that things were going to develop. <clears throat> and there's other things that um, people would tell you about the history that was passed on down that um, Union Level at one time was bigger than South Hill. Mm. But what helped South Hill so much was the roadway. You go through South Hill, you can run from Miami to Maine right up Route 1. Good morning. <clears throat> that was a big factor deciding, um, you know, where to develop that. The road, what we call 58, run east to west all the way across the state from Norfolk to the mountains. And it intersected in South Hill. And there again, uh, there were... Uh, a lot more advantages, what have you. I can remember, you look back up through here, on a Saturday afternoon or evening, um, I've seen so many people in this town that wasn't anywhere to park. Mm. And most of them would be mules and wagons, or somebody riding a horse, or a lot of people pulled the old tobacco slides tobacco slaves, whatever they called them. I mean, that was just to go to town to get a uh, sack of beans, some side meat. It, 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 it was a very essential. There wasn't a steakhouse in Union Level for years, I can tell you. And I, I don't see one coming. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, I think the biggest development went on in until the 30s that we had a bank. And uh, y'all were pretty accurate on the history of that. And when it failed, and then World War II started, a lot of the young people left here, and, and they found out there was other things to do other than farm. Another <clears throat> big factor about that, about 1948 or 9, they were drilling over here uh, southwest of us to put Bugs Island Dam in, John H. Carr Lake. And that to a lot of the uh, younger people around here and some of the old showed that you could make a living doing something else. Uh, they they liked that weekly paycheck. And my uncle and a lot of his friends started over there. That's where they became iron workers. <clears throat> Excuse me just a minute. My wife told me, she said, everybody brings food, but nobody brings them water. <laughs> so she's been doing that. Yeah. I'll start keeping some in the truck in case I come through. I know you do, and it's, it's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, this is another picture of my dad. I was only about three or four years old. <clears throat> and he plowed the garden, which is behind the store here. And we always had a big garden, and the neighbors, he shared it with the neighbors and what have you. This is another picture of my mother <clears throat> and my half-brother. And that would have been the old Simmons store, which later became the post office. And you can see the old dance hall was white. Sure was. Yep. That, that was before the 1960s. Uh, in a minute, we'll talk about the dance song. Miss Clark and them did a, a wonderful job putting this together and getting photographs from everywhere. It's uh, pictures in here of South Hill, surrounding areas. There's pictures in here of people that served in our services. <clears throat> this will give you the history Union Level remembered. And uh, it talks about the stores and the people that, that lived here and the families and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of the other surrounding areas. And one of the articles came from uh, <clears throat> Miss Hilda Hood from the uh, Let family in where the 
the stores behind the kids right here in, in the yard on the left. And this again showed you that there was a building beside the drugstore. And it was a good sized building. And uh, she went on to say that <clears throat> it burnt down and uh, the man that was in it perished back in there. And what year was that? Probably, uh, I'd have to look. That would have been in the 40s. Okay. But uh, <clears throat> like I said, there's a lot of history in here of the people that in the community, the old school pictures, um, pictures from servicemen in World War II, even pictures of some people that uh, served during the Civil War. It was just a, a bunch of people got together to share family stories and family photos, but it turned out to be a real good history book. South Hill, um, like I said, it prospered and developed quicker and that was another part of Union level of decline because after the 40s, and a lot of the young guys had been in service, they found that they could do something else. People used to get uh, more cars. <clears throat> and we live right up here beside Let Store. I was raised there. And we went to town every Saturday morning. Mama would get her chicken and, and uh, canned goods and stuff like that where all the stores here were mostly catering to the sharecroppers and, and you know they were living off of beans and meat and flour and stuff like that <clears throat> uncle ashby back in the 30s had a great gimmick my dad worked for him and he had a delivery truck and if you lived out on the farm and you didn't want to drive the mules and wagons to town uh, to pick up something, you just come up here and tell him, send me so-and-so. And my dad would deliver it, fertilizer and stuff like that, something too heavy to carry, you know, by hand. <clears throat> and a lot of it was done by bartering. Uh, people would bring in eggs, a ham, uh, side meat. And at different times, they would, uh, the stores would get a round tub, a wooden tub of salted herring. And people thought that was great, you know, they would be able to get something like that. <clears throat> and when Uncle Ashby had accumulated a, a good amount of stuff, he would load his truck and carry it to Richmond. He could sell it to the wholesalers down there for more than he could get up here. And uh, it was just a, Uh, 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 idea and good business that he, uh, you know, was looking that far ahead. Now, during the summertime, and I remember, Will, I'd be laying in the bed. We didn't, we only had a screen on the windows. There was no such thing in the air condition. I'd wake up in the morning. I'd hear those screen doors on those stores slamming. Oh, I'd hear a mule going up the road pulling a tobacco slide. <clears throat> and they would stop and tie the mules or the horses up to those posts right there. They'd go in the store and get tobacco, you know, cigarettes, just little odd things. On occasion, the kids would get a drink or something. And uh, one of the big things back then that I remember, <clears throat> there was a always hoop cheese. That was the cheese that was in the little... Uh, wooden hoop there <clears throat> and for a quick snack you can get you a piece of cheese and it was a big vanilla uh, cake we called them Johnny cakes and people would get a piece of cheese and a Johnny cake and that would be their lunch or they'd get a can of pork and beans or uh, sardines <laughs> it was it was little things that just catered to you know, the community. It was a low income family oriented community. So you had to have low income uh, merchandise. 
All righty, are we ready to walk? We are. I also saw on YouTube uh, a photograph of Union Level. Somebody took it, I'd say probably 10 years ago. There was another store that sat right there. It was Mrs. G.R. Thompson. And uh, I think she closed it in the early 40s, after, mm. right after the Depression. But it was a big old two-story store that sat there. And uh, <clears throat> this right here was called the L.W. Lett store. This is where the skid kids caught the school bus in the morning, right here beside us. Um, he had a, a a general supply of merchandise there, maybe some shoes, but no clothing, stuff like that. Uh, when I was young, uh, he might have had it in early years. But uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lett had a, uh, another building adjoining the store in the back. And this is, that was where they used to have elections. That was where you voted in Union Level in the back of the store. And uh, of course, the house right there beside it, he owned that. That's where his family lived. And that's where I was raised at. Hmm. They moved out about 47 or 48. And my dad rented the house. They were close friends of the families. And I stayed there until 1963. Then we went to South Hill. <clears throat> but that was how I was telling you. That room on the outside right there was uh, our bedroom. And I'd <clears throat> wake up in the morning with nothing but the screen and you'd hear these screen doors on these stores slamming people going in and out. It, it was brings back great memories. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else. Back in the 40s and 50s when current, they brought current to Union Level, <clears throat> you could go in these stores late in the evening until they'd probably close up about eight o'clock at night. And the lights, there was three or four lights on each side of the store, but they'd only turn one on. And that would be up where the cash register and stuff was at. <clears throat> and where you kept the cigarettes and small novelty items. But now if you wanted some shoes or some clothes or something, he'd walk down to another section turn the light on. Hmm. And all of them were like that. Another thing that I remember about going around with my dad, you'd go up to somebody's house at night. You didn't see any lights in the windows. You may see a light, but you wouldn't see a bunch of lights, no porch lights or anything like that. <clears throat> and dad would uh, toot the horn on the car and get out, and he'd go stand in front of the headlights so they could see him, so they'd know who it was and he would deliver messages. There were only two telephones in Union Level for many years. One was in that store right there, and the other one was in our house. Hmm. And Parker Oil Company, or Simmons Oil Company, which Dad drove a truck for, <clears throat> asked him to put a phone in so that they could call him at night and tell him of things that he needed to look forward to the next day about early deliveries and stuff, you know, before he came to work. And that was the purpose of it. But everybody around here knew who had the telephone, and I was the gopher. Telephone rang, Mama said, Jimmy, go tell so-and-so phone call. And I'd run a halfway around the neighborhood just to tell somebody that you wanted on the phone. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Dad did that, you know, just as a common courtesy to the community, but Uncle last but he charged you down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing about this that's uh, must have let, uh, like I said, a lot of research. Um, John Knight was a master at it. L.W. Let purchased the General Merchandise Store, Merchandise Store, established in 1905, 
from Catherine Davis, widow of James Davis in 1929. That's when Muscalette bought it. And uh, over the years, there was a kind of an apartment up there. I've known people who live up there. And uh, it was a voting precinct. This is where we caught the school bus and all the kids would come down and, and get candy. Uh, I can remember several, I think about late 70s, it closed up for good. And, uh, but Mr. C.D. Gill ran it when I was a kid after Ms. Letnam left. <clears throat> Clarence Thompson came in here and ran it from the 50s on up until the late 60s. Uh, a fellow named Jimmy Carpenter came in and ran it. And uh, finally, when some of the people in the uh, Thompson estate, uh, children got a hold to it, they sold it. A fellow named Matthew Wells bought it. And then we got to ghost town. <laughs> Most of Wells was big on stories about when he grew up here, <clears throat> and he would tell you about coming to kid. I mean, coming to junior level as kid, and up there, Mr. Ferguson had an apartment up there when he had the store, and it, nobody had curtains. I mean, it was you might pull a shade or something, but uh, he would tell you about. At night, Mr. Ferguson had one of those bug sprayers, you know, and he'd be up there walk, walking around, and the only thing up there was a light behind him, you know, so you got the ghost effect. He'd be up there spraying them bugs, <laughs> and that's a lot of where the ghost story comes from. <laughs> uh, let's see, we've covered the drugstore, Uncle Ashby store, like I said, there was Simmons and Drumright. And uh, and that was this one right in front of us. That was the one right in front of mm -hmm. us. Uh, Lewis Thompson bought that probably in the mid-60s. The Drumright sold out their estate. <clears throat> then, of course, of course, that was a bank, and there were several people... Um, that were in that, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. There was an old bachelor here in Union Level named Levy Roberts. Everybody knew him. <clears throat> he could grow flowers in that asphalt if he wanted to. And uh, he was just a, a sharecropper down on the Myra farm, and he would come to town on Saturdays and stuff like that to get his stuff. And you might see him during the week, but it wouldn't be often. And he was a grumpy old rascal. And everybody knew him. And us kids were scared to death of him. You know, he could look at you and grunt. <laughs> and you'd haul freight. <laughs> but uh, during the time that the bank was going under, Levy had been to South Hill and sold his tobacco. Well, he came back to put some money in his account in the bank. <clears throat> and as he told it, if I remember it correctly, there was a guy in there named Strawhacker that was clerk. And Levy went up to him and told him that he wanted to deposit some money to his account. And Mr. Strawhacker told him, he said, Levy, go on. I don't have time to mess with you right now. And he really got insulted. He went to every store around here telling them what the man at the bank had done to him. 12 o'clock that day, they closed the doors. He didn't realize the man was doing him a favor. But uh, that, that was a That's big story. That's when the bank around. closed. That's when the bank closed. Wow. Went into receivership. Hmm. <clears throat> This building right here, uh, like I said, there were apartments, apartment upstairs, and it was an older lady back in the 50s, I'm sure she was close to 80, lived up there. Uh, 
Her son, Charlie Gill, Morris Gill, and Preston Gill would all come over to see her. <clears throat> and then August of 1954, Hurricane Hazel come through here. I was only six years old. <clears throat> and the only news you got about it was on the South Hill radio station, which the radio probably stayed on all day. We didn't have TV. And Mama took my sister and I, <clears throat> and brought us across the road, and we went in the old bank building. Mama figured that was the safest because it was between two brick buildings. Mm. And that's where we rode at Hazel. <clears throat> my mama, that Saturday morning, <clears throat> had taken a lady to town that uh, was a friend of the family. And her husband worked at the Ford place in South Hill. Well, I don't recall his wife's name, but she couldn't drive. So Mama took her. Hazel took the roof off of that building. It was a tin roof, old roll tin roof. <clears throat> Brought it over in our yard and covered up his 55 Ford, brand new. <laughs> I won't ever forget it. All right, and to give you a little information on that, <clears throat> That was the old hotel next door. That's my mother. That's the tin roof. And it's a 55 oh, Ford under there. Wow. Isn't that something? It really is. It sat vacant over the years. And looking back down there where our truck is at, oh, our vehicle. When I was a kid, there was a post office down there, about half the size of the store here. And <clears throat> that's where, you know, the mail trucks come in and years later, they didn't have to get it off the train. They had mail trucks come through. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, a guy that lived up on top of the hill, uh, Tommy Gordon, a real nice man. He had come back from World War II and he had problem with his legs and all. I don't really know what they called it. <clears throat> but he squatted down to smoke a cigarette. And it was a bunch of old dried straw, rabbit, uh, broom straw and stuff, caught on fire and burned the post office down. Yeah. They moved it out of town for a while and they brought it back and put it right here. It stayed till the 1980s and it was closed up when everything was moved to South Hill. <clears throat> All right, getting up here to this building. John did the history on it. And it started out, as John told, told us, it was a, built as a hay and grain storage by Mr. Lynn Summer. I mean, yeah. And uh, there was, you can see in apartments upstairs and stuff like that. <clears throat> but in the 1950s, when we were kids out here playing, it wasn't a written rule, but it was a common practice that Saturday at 12 o'clock, everybody quit work. Everybody quit work. My, uh, we had been to town in the morning. My dad come in. He had finished his week. And, <clears throat> well, a fellow named Matthew Bennett, we called him Uncle Peter Bennett, would come up here in the morning on Saturday, and he'd ice down the drinks and have the nabs. That was a Whirlitz of jukebox in there. <clears throat> and I can't tell you how many times I heard Blueberry Hill standing right here in this yard. And the uh, the young young people would go in there and they would dance and, and you'd hear them just like all the other kids. They'd be cackling and, and laughing and playing and, and uh, what have you. Uh, they'd go to the stores up and down the street but they'd work all week to maybe save a nickel or nine just so they could go to the union level on Saturday. Mm. <clears throat> Late on Saturday evening, the older generation would come in. That's when you'd have the disturbances. 
and Uncle Uncle Peter, he closed it up at 10 o'clock, and you'd hear him say, all right, time for everybody to go home. And uh, he uh, he was a good man. I, I remember going over and seeing him and talking to him. All right, getting back right here where the vacant lot is at. This was where the old two-story hotel was at. And um, during our childhood, back in the 50s, my sister and I, we'd play all up and down here. There was a family living there, Miss Maggie Hendricks, and she had four sons living with her at this downstairs in the hotel. <clears throat> and one of the sons came back out of service to help look after her and the family because his dad had died. And he was very dear to all of us. He and his wife, it was Ethan Bertha, uh, took to carrying the kids places to town, carrying us to the movies, carrying us to ball games. I mean, he played an important role in my life. And uh, I treasure all of those memories too. And his mother, Miss Maggie, you just didn't find anybody any sweeter. But moving on up. <clears throat> All right, this was the last store built in Union Level, and it was built around 1960. And I showed you the picture of Christine Thompson standing in front of us, the Archie Ferguson store. And we thought this was a big thing because when Blakely built this, probably in maybe 60 or 61, uh, he kind of updated things. He had a, a display case with meats in it. He had the uh, first bologna slicing machine I ever saw. He could cut you a half pound of bologna, and it'd be right on a half pound. Most of the other stores did it by... Uh, Butchering eyes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but when the old store, Mr. Ferguson's store that Blakely was running when it burnt down, there was a machine shed behind it that belonged to Mr. Uh, Simmons's nephew, Len Wilkerson. He had tractors, boats, all kinds of equipment in it. When that store burnt that night, it burnt down everything behind it. They never did put any of it back. There was a road that went by that oak tree around behind the other stores. And back there, <clears throat> there was a storage house, as we call them. Uh, in earlier times, they took stuff off of the train and stored it behind the store and brought it up as it was needed. And there was a big old hay shed back as it burnt. And, uh, I retired the first time in 2003, I was 55 years old. And I took a 3,000 forward tractor with a bush hog and I cleaned up everything around here. And I would take a little John Deere lawnmower and cut beside the streets. I kept it neat as a pen. <clears throat> but and it was never done intentionally, I know, because it was too nice of a person. He loved history too. When we started Union Level Ghost Town, and some of them cats come in here and went through these buildings, that's when it got out of hand. You're right. Uh, they stole about everything they could take out of here. And, I mean, I lost old boat motors, all kinds of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and I realized that the more I cleaned this up, the more access I was giving everybody. So I quit. And uh, Mr. Wilkerson's son, he's got most of the labor around here now that's working in the farm, but he he doesn't really have an interest in it and um, doing anything with it. I'm 75 years old. I'm not going to sink anything into it anymore. Uh, I'd like to see it preserved in some manner. I'm talking to rails for trails, and, and I don't know if the County Historical Society I've got to check on that, <clears throat> or what have you. But it'd just... be it'd be really nice if it could be saved in some way and organized, so you could have visitors come and look at it without 
vandalism, theft, destruction, and it, you know, make it safe and make it where people can learn about the place. Really? I mean, things like this don't exist much anymore. You're very true. And the only way they're going to get knowledge of it <clears throat> is through videos and stuff like y'all are doing. I come through here a lot of times and <clears throat> there'll be people parked on the side of the road and they'll be walking and looking and I'll stop and I'm asking y'all visiting. I've seen them come from Nebraska, Wisconsin. <clears throat> they were on vacation and they just wanted to see. You know, and I give them what history I knew of it. That probably lasted 30 minutes for them, you know, and well, I've seen it, I've been there. And one, one other thing I meant to point out, we were coming up through that. <clears throat> you look down at the drug right store. See the arch windows on top? Yeah. Look at the old bank building. See the lindels on top? Yeah. I mean, that was, and, it, and the old um, post office. There is such thing as building something, but there's also building with craftsmanship. And people pointed that out to me now, the decorative stuff on the front and stuff like that. <clears throat> Over the years, this stuff had to be brought in by rail. We had sawmills around here, I'm sure, but the closest uh, brick factory is over 25 miles from here. That's down in Lawrenceville, Virginia. And uh, <clears throat> it just amazed me when you stop and think about it, the pride and craftsmanship that they put into that. And it was all built back in the teens and 20s. This right here came into being <clears throat> in the Thompson family in the late teens or early 20s. Now, um, I didn't do the research, John did. He's got in the book here that the house here beside it, that's where Ashby Thompson and Margaret lived and their son, Lewis. <clears throat> he bought that from a fellow named E.L. Petty in 1928. That would have made Lewis five years old. Uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of oak trees and in, in there in the in the yard beside it um, My dad after working for Uncle Ashby Down at the store through the years came up here and worked for a guy named Horace Blaylock I think was his name <clears throat> and he ran a repair shop for cars and stuff and my brother told me that during the 1930s and stuff, when they were living here in Union Level, he would come up to the garage and Daddy would explain cars to him. And he'd hang around here and then he'd go play somewhere else. But anyway, there's a strip of land that goes from that store over to this road all the way back to the old railroad. And uh, over the years, there was an old stable back there and that's where Lewis kept his horses, ponies and horses. And uh, this is the place up here that I hung around most. <clears throat> but uh, after Mr. Blaylock left, I was probably in the 40s, Lewis took that thing and used it for a machine shed. There's an old New Holland hay bale in there right now. There is an old farm all 1941H tractor in there. And the hay baler had a Wisconsin motor on it because it, it uh, didn't have a power drive on the tractor. It had to run independent. <clears throat> and I can remember that thing being taken out and put back in a lot of times. People have gone in there and torn the doors up. And that's the reason I don't I don't keep it clean anymore. I, you know, I'll tell them, I says, look, you know, we appreciate it if you don't go in there, but if you go around, you got a good chance of getting snake bit. Yeah. You know. 
you talk about the old hotel here. Must have seen these gill, which live right through the thing over there. He had four sons. Wait a minute. William Blakely Thurman Pettis. He had four sons and two daughters. <clears throat> and he was the one that came over and ran the store during the 1950s when I was growing up. Right here in this little section, that would be tent shows come in. Um, they would come in and pitch something not big as a circus tent, but a tent. And I remember going with the kid that her parents were running it. We'd go down to the um, post office and pick the film up. <clears throat> We'd bring it back to her dad up here. And he would put in the projector and hold up a piece of cardboard wasn't much bigger than that. And he'd show us the cartoons. <laughs> but uh, for those that didn't have an opportunity to go to South Hill and stuff like that, <clears throat> that was a, a great form of entertainment. You know, you go in there, it was just wooden benches sitting on some kind of a upright to, that you sat on. <clears throat> I actually saw a guy come in one time, the last time I remember anything being there, and I was probably about 54, something like that. A guy came here with a car pulling a little trailer, and he had a little plywood platform out there. And he was walking, had blocks in his hands, walking on his hands with his feet in the air. I thought that was it. My daddy, said, he said, son, this people can do anything. <laughs> Like I said, I'd like to see in some manner that it be preserved. <clears throat> I'll tell you a story about the dance hall down here. My dad was known to take a drink, especially on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and we had a horse with a stable behind the house there and a lot. And that's where we kept the horse at. Now, I'd go down and catch the horse and catch up with Rosa and Jean. We'd go riding and stuff like that. <clears throat> but this one, one particular Saturday afternoon, Daddy took the horse out and was let her go and graze in front yard. Had good grass. Well, <clears throat> he sat down and dozed off and went to sleep. The horse hung her foot in the halter. Where was the first place she went? middle of the dance hall. <laughs> You've never seen people come through doors in your life <laughs> screaming and hollering. <laughs> <clears throat> and there was a gentleman that was a good friend of my daddy's was in Mustard Drumwright's store. And he heard the commotion and he come running out. <clears throat> and he Aubrey let run up in there and pulled it a, a knife. And one swipe, he cut that halter loose on that horse's head. She was free, it won't no problem, she come back home. <laughs> but Lord only knows what <laughs> happened if Aubrey let had him went and I cut her loose. <laughs> that, that was a big joke for a lot of weeks after that. Every time they get started up on Saturday evening, first question they ask, where the horse? <laughs> <laughs> What are the structures of the building like? Excuse me? What are the structure of the building like? Are they still, can you go inside? Is it dangerous or? It's dangerous. <clears throat> Everything, the floors are gone. The old drum right store down now doesn't even have a roof on it. It's collapsed and come in. And the floors I'm sure are just as bad. Um, This was the old post office. Uh, Aunt Margaret had a, she was a millinery. And she had her millinery shop upstairs. I've got receipts where she would order stuff from Baltimore and New York, and it would be sent here. Uh, she made hats, stuff like that. I mean, you could go in that store right now, you could get anything from sewing thread to dye, needles. <clears throat> All the old houses on the table had oilcloth. 
and you go in there and just tell the man how much oil cloth you wanted. Another thing, and I'm sure Mr. Jones was his influence because he really <clears throat> updated things as much as possible. There was a counter in there on that side of the store over there. At halfway. And there were stools at it spun around. And they were made out of wood tops. Oh no. <clears throat> and where Lewis started started getting rid of stuff in the 80s and early 90s. He had a guy come here that specialized in antique stuff. <clears throat> and um, he bought the old jukebox to come over to dance all of that. Lewis had it down here in the store. He bought the counters, the twirling seats, and the showcases. There were four showcases that were probably six to eight foot long. Just glass. <clears throat> and then there was one on the counter where you put your candy and stuff. Everybody went and saw those, you know. But he sold all the um, all the fixtures there that somebody would use to re replenish an old antique store or something. Like I said, I'd like to see in some manner that it be preserved. 